Isn't it nice to know that you've done something right? Let me tell you something. Before, before we get into King Kong, King Kong can wait. Uh, he's been around since 1933. He can wait. You know, there is a difference between intelligent people and geniuses. Not that I'm a genius, but I'm just saying there's a differentiation between different types of intelligence. And the people who are geniuses aren't necessarily smarter than the smart person. You know what the difference is? They have the same general IQ. The difference is that a genius works a little bit harder, just two more hours a day usually. And um, so the, the, the difference, hey, it's Dave Altman. What's up, my brother? I love you. Dave Altman is a um, manager extraordinaire. He manages many acts. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say who they are because he's always in between stuff and and. Some of them uh, are prone to professional jealousy. Look at that glare on my glasses. I got to do something about this. Anyway, uh, so so the difference between an intelligent person and a genius is the uh, an intelligent person can rise to the occasion. They, they can take pretty much any any situation in life and in their environment and achieve and succeed. But a genius can sculpt their environment around them to suit their own personal will. Of course, you can have an evil genius. You can have uh, Mussolini or Hitler or Stalin, someone like that. But you can have great geniuses like Einstein who can actually take a look at this world and what it has to offer them and figure out what they want to achieve and kind of make things happen like that. But the, the difference between the genius and the intelligent person isn't their IQ. It's how hard they work. And the moral of the story is it's nice to know that uh, I didn't give up. I got back on my horse. I gave it the old college try and I succeeded. And here I am talking to you lovely people. Um, so uh, I love you, Dave. You're the man. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave Altman. Uh, let me tell you about Dave Altman. Now, Dave, uh, put your uh, Twitter and all that stuff in the chat so people can follow you. Uh, so Dave Altman had the misfortune of managing Brandon Novak when he was in the lows of his addiction. And uh, as much as he wanted to believe, and and uh, uh, you know, Dave does a little recovery stuff too, as far as um, helping uh, people who once had addiction problems, and so he he understands that world very well. And so uh, there were some times, and he wanted so bad to believe that Novak was straight. And uh, Novak tried so hard to sell him the dream that he was straight. And uh, let's just say that Novak messed up some appearances. Um, so, um, so yeah, so Dave Altman is at, um, at, what's this? At 4T, oh, I can't read that. I got to get new glasses. Oh, at Fort. E, you guys can read it. I said that it ends with Jedi. Um, uh, anyway, um, yeah. So a lot of people are asking about the the Novak and Franz show, which was the the Novak and Franz podcast, and uh, our producer uh, who runs the whole Might Be News Network. Um, he is terrified of getting COVID, as we all are. So uh, we decided to put it on ho on hiatus. Plus, we generally recorded in uh, my nuclear fortified bunker uh, 12 feet underground and it's and it's a little hard to get to you got to pass through town it's a very dangerous situation to get to where we actually do the recording um so uh anyway let's get on to king Kong. so so there there we have it we have a little bit in wisdom uh, we have a little bit of an update so let, let's get on to uh, our, our classic king kong's film so let's Let's go through these in order. Um, okay, so you know you got the original King Kong, um, uh, Marion C. Cooper uh, uh, produced the film, uh, and um, what's it? Where's my fucking head? Willis O'Brien, my goddamn head, my favorite stop motion animator of all time. Will, Will, um, uh, Willis O'Brien did the stop motion animation. So to make this film, uh, they had to pioneer all of the effects because it had never been done before. So this is the first movie with a big monster. 
as a, as as the star of the film. There was other big monster movies, but never anything like this. And Willis O'Brien was actually the who did all the stop motion was working at a grocery store, and it was during the depression, and he didn't want to give up his grocery store job to work on a movie because he didn't know if he could get that job back once the movie work was over. Um, as it turned out, he had this incredible gift for stop motion animation. And um, as far as the expressions and the body language in this film, this is, this is my second favorite in the King Kong slash Big Ape series. Um, it's the first major motion picture with thematic music. At the time, sound films the sound was just coming in. They were, they called them the talkies, and it was it was a very big deal, and it was it was a technological feat to have sounds during a film. Um, so, like in order to create the just the roar for King Kong, they took a lion's uh, roar and they reversed it, and then they layered it. So it was the the normal roar, and then the backwards roar layered on top of it. So it kind of. It sounds like it comes up from the chest and then it reverberates, but it gets louder as the chest expands, you know, and all of the, the, the ways that they would split the screen down the middle and do the optical printer work. It, it just, it just had never been done before. And they were afraid at times that the, the film uh, would seem a little bit hokey um, uh, to, to the audiences. They had no idea how a film like this would, would be received. And, there were some scenes where, you know, you have to actually have to touch the puppet, right? So you have film running through the camera and you can see through the eyepiece of the camera, but you can't, sometimes the exposure is a little different. Sometimes one of the lights will burn out during the scene. It takes hours and hours to do this, you know, and I, I'm sure you, if you're watching this, you probably know about stop motion animation. You got to move the puppet, take a frame of film, move the puppet, but you got to take into account all of the movement. So if he's turning his head, lifting his arm to, to grab another dinosaur and stepping forward, you have to log each and every one of these minuscule movements. And you have to keep in mind that this isn't digital. What I mean by that is um, the emotion of the person has an effect on the, the animal. It, the, the movements come from the per person's mind. It's like a transference of the will. It, it's almost like a mass hypnosis done through this, these puppets. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, it, the, the film was, it, it was a colossal hit. And, um, you know, it gave way to many other King Kong films. Um, of course, we have uh, Son of Kong, um, what's his name? Uh, Robert Armstrong uh, returns. He he played the ship captain in in the, the first King Kong film, and um, so you know, of course, uh, Willis O'Brien did the stop motion animation, and Marion C. Cooper, uh, you know, returned as producer. And Mary C. Cooper, he had done a lot of like nature films. Like what he did as a producer was bring people two locations they had never seen before. He was one of the first people to go to Africa and film wild tigers. Like they would catch a tiger and they would figure out a way to film this fucking tiger without getting killed and battling the elements too in a place like Africa, you know, where, where the heat is so intense, it could actually melt the film in the camera. So incredible guy. Um, but it was years later. So King Kong was 1933. Son of Kong, I think was 1935. Yeah, Mighty Joe Young, when was this? 1947, I believe. 1949. Um, and I had to put my name on this because I do that to every movie that I lend out because there are so many movies that I've lent out that I've never gotten back, such as every copy of Haggard that I have ever had. Uh, so anyway, um, so the whole cast returns. And um, Robert Armstrong, who played the ship captain in King Kong and Son of Kong, even returned in this. Now, Mighty Joe Young doesn't have anything to do with King Kong. He's a whole other character. But let me tell you, the stop motion animation in this and the sympathy and empathy you have for this big ape, for Mighty Joe Young, it, 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 this is the ultimate kids movie. I mean, this, you're going to, 
I mean, if, I cried in King Kong when I was a kid, of course, but um, this is this is a tearjerker, and uh, he just seems so human, you know. So anyway, so let's get on to what I think is a badass movie, and I wish there was a picture of it on here. Was the 1976 King Kong? You had Jessica Lang. You had um. Oh my God, my it, it's getting late. I can't even think. It's it's Jeff Bridges, of course, and Charles Grodin, uh, who plays uh, Robert Armstrong's character as the the ship captain, and they go looking for oil on this on this deserted island. But and the rather than stop motion animation, the ape is a guy in a suit. Now I know what you're thinking, ultra cheese, but. This is a, a De Laurentiis film. So at the time, this was the most expensive movie ever made. And um, boy, this is the first movie I saw in the theater. And I thought it was real. Like, I had no idea. Like, at the end, when King Kong dies, my dad was like, why are you crying? I said, because King Kong's dead. You see? He said, well, it's only a movie. And I said, what does that mean? I didn't understand. The illusion was complete. And I was mesmerized and captivated and, and, and brought into this world where King Kong was a living being. So Rick Baker, special effects extraordinaire. I mean, if you don't know that name, I don't know what to tell you. You got to Google it. But uh, he made this ape suit and then they couldn't find anyone to wear it. And he was like, why don't I wear it? I, I know what I'm doing. And the pantomimes and, uh, and the body language and even his face, you could see his eyes, you know, his... When he when he, when he would get sad, he would do th this kind of stuff with his eyes, and and they had the the facial expression on that ape suit was just so beautiful. Uh, this is a colossal film, and it's the first movie that I can think of where you see the city get wrecked by by a huge monster, and it looks absolutely one hundred percent believable. And so, uh, so this is nineteen seventy six, so. You have King Kong Lives, which I believe Rick Baker returned in the ape suit. It was the same ape suit they used for the first one, and it came out in 1986, almost 10 years later. And it has, um, it's still a De, La De Laurentiis film. Of course, the, the De Laurentiis is, be there no mistake about it, that was a mafia organization. It was a way to um, uh, money launder. Uh, union money and set design money and all kinds of stuff. They film in different locations all around the world for the for the De Laurentiis films. Uh, they did all the you know not all they did a lot of the spaghetti westerns. They did Barbarella. They did you know humongous films, and there was so much money passing when you make a film. So much money passes, it changes hands so quickly. A lot of times, it's hard to tell where that money went and. Uh, if you don't believe me, I could tell you some stories about some films that I worked on that I saw some money quickly go missing from. We won't get into that now. Uh, I think a couple people who are watching this just got quite afraid. So, um, but yeah, so uh, this is starring uh, Linda Hamilton from the Terminator movies. The movie's horrible. Uh, it's kind of silly, uh, but... It's worth watching for camp reasons, but it's but it's nowhere near as good as the 1976 King Kong. <sighs> I wanted to like this so bad. My mom loved it. I watched it with my mom. Oh, she loved it, and she hated the other King Kong movie. She doesn't want to see a movie about a gorilla. She wants to see uh, Tootsie. She wants to see Terms of Endearment. She wants to see Beaches with Bette Midler, my mom. But she loved this movie. It was... They tried to ride the uh, the fine line that you have to ride between hokey and camp, and you know, and and a real movie you're gonna have an emotionally emotional involvement in. And uh, sad to say, but I wanted to like it. So that said, let's go to the chat. So, are there any questions? So let me see. Let me see what we got here. Oh my God. Jeez. Know, fabulous. Wow. Oh, Dave Altman says 12 years sober. Hell yeah. The man. Love to hear that. You know, it's always nice to hear someone who comes out and says 
that they're sober because it is such a rare thing because there are so many people struggling with addiction who are so afraid to be judged. And, uh, and it, it's only been until very recently, I would say in the past three years when like Alcoholics Anonymous isn't really anonymous anymore. Um, it's okay to have a problem. And so many people have suffer from so many addictions in this world. And, and our vice is just, just get uh, control of us. I was reading an article earlier today on, on porn addiction. Apparently, um, uh, and I don't know if it's an epidemic or not, but, uh, but it's a big problem where people are not having successful relationships anymore because they are afraid of intimacy. And maybe that has to do with... Um, uh, the, our society's embracement of, of porn, you know, um, I do think porn is, is a huge problem. I do think there's a general immorality about it. And you, you have to understand, uh, one of the big problems about porn is that it, it subverts our nation's youth. Like if you don't have a lot of options in life, like these young girls and guys will start to look at pornography. Like, Oh my God, I can make $1,500 in a day and then maybe do some things on the side of hell. I'm having sex for free with, you know, with people that I meet, why not get paid for it? And I, I was looking at a list. Uh, I Googled um, a list of porn star deaths and a lot of the guys die of AIDS. Um, a lot of them die in traffic accidents, actually. Um, and there are a lot of traffic accidents in America where people are, are casualties, but not like this because they lead such reckless lives. Um, a lot of them die, it says, for health-related issues, which usually means a, a, a drug overdose. Um, uh, I think I mentioned that a lot of the men die of AIDS. And a lot of the uh, trans, I don't know, what do you, what do you call them? Trans, transsexual, where they, you get the sex change. And uh, a lot of them die uh, of suicide a lot of them end up committing suicide and i, I so anyway there's, there's a lot of problems with that lifestyle and there's a lot of people who want to tell you that sex work is okay and it doesn't you know you can wash your hands of the whole thing and you can just ignore your human emotions and your 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 wants for a, a, a connection and, and but it, it does not lead to healthy relationships so anyway i don't know how the fuck i got on oh we were talking about addiction <laughs> um so uh anyway uh what do we got here uh king kong's fur was his wife's fur coat oh yeah dave yeah that's true that's true mary c cooper i think it, it, not mary c cooper um uh wills o'brien the stop motion animator um he when he made the original 1933 King Kong, he he went to the hardware store and he made the skeleton out of pieces that you buy from little ball joints that, that, that you get. I don't even know what they would use them for, but you know, it's uh you kind of uh, tighten up the joint on the ball and then you can, you know, you can move it, it'll it'll hold every time you move the 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 animal. But how's it gonna be furry over that? What's he gonna have? So he took foam and then his wife had an old rabbit coat that she would, that she wasn't wearing much anymore. So he took it, cut it apart. And, uh, uh, that was, that was King Kong's fur. Um, the, I, there, I think there were three models for King Kong for the different scenes. One was a little bit smaller for scale. The bigger ones are always hard to work with because whenever you have a bigger model, you have to have a bigger set. You have to have everything, just everything you make has to be bigger. Um, so sometimes it's better to make them small. It just goes a little easier. Um, but, you know, for those close-ups and the, the fighting scenes and stuff where you need some a lot of articulation, you tend to use the bigger ones. So, um, uh, and the, I think one of them still has bits of the rabbit fur. Of course, that stuff decays over time. I used to have this house here was full of reindeer furs. I was like, oh, I'm so cool. I got reindeer furs. Because every time I went to Finland, I've been there five times, and reindeer are, it's a, uh, it's a cattle there. Uh, they eat them. They use all the parts of them. It, it's, it's part of their economy. Uh, it's delicious, by the way. I feel like gamey stuff. I love it. But, um, yeah, so I had fur 
over everything, over every couch. And it's like, I know that they treat these things. You know, I had a uh, cow skin couch. I had a coon skin cap. You know, the raccoon skin with the tail and everything. Every time I get something made of animal fur, it get it just decays. The, the flesh rots or whatever it is, and all the fur falls out. And you get, there's fur everywhere. So I, I gave them away. Um, anyway, Max Andervision. I know that name. What's up, Max Ander? I, well, I, I said earlier in the stream, I was looking at some photos. I s came across some ones that you had sent me like 10 years ago. Uh, it was a fun day hanging out with you. Um, uh, let me see here. Fuck yeah. Huge fan, says Eric Shores. Thank you so much, Eric. It's very kind of you. Um, oh, yeah. Dave says uh, Charles Grogan gets stomped. That's what. Oh, 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 oh. I wanted to get to that. So that's one of the cool things about you got to get this version of the original King Kong. You can get some real cheapies. They're like $6 or whatever. This, so, okay. You're going to like this. So when they were making movies in the 60s and 70s, they would shoot many, many versions. Like, for example, Darren Miller, uh, the former sing singer of CKY and the, the artist who wrote most of the songs and everything, you know, Darren Miller, a huge horror fan. He told me that there's like 27 versions of the movie Halloween because they would always film alternate scenes and stuff because some weren't really TV safe. Um and uh, uh, so there's a scene when Charles Grodin gets stomped in this. And I always wondered, you see the, the foot come down uh, and you, you see the foot come come into the camera, you know, from Charles Grodin's point of view when King Kong's stomping around in, in the crowd. And he's like, ah, and then you see the foot come into the camera. But then when King Kong lifts the foot, you see there's only a hat there. So either as a child, I was thinking, did he escape at the last second or did he just stick to King Kong's foot? Like if you ever stepped on a, like if your cat ever went to the bathroom, like right next to the litter box and you're walking around in your bare feet and then you, you step on that little piece of poop and then it just sticks to the bottom of your foot. I don't know, maybe he was like that. But, uh, but yeah, so they would film, so they filmed a lot of alternate scenes for this movie and this is the only version with all of the scenes in them. The other ones are cut down to anything. Um, and actually, that brings me to a great point about the original. So this movie was actually a lost movie. You read about those a lot of times. Um, uh, what is that, the Laugh Clown movie? Uh, just like uh, Lon Chaney, not Lon Chaney Jr., the original Lon Chaney in the 1920s. A lot of his films were lost. So a lot of times you'd have these studio fires, and a lot of the old films were made it on nitrates, which was like highly fucking flammable. It was almost explosive once it decayed a lot. So um, in the original King Kong, oh, so that, so anyway, so you hear a lot about a lot, a lot of movies getting lost in big studio fires. You can see pictures of them and it's heartbreaking because these are films that we read about and sometimes there's little clips of them we'll see, but we'll never, we'll never see them. We'll never see them. So anyway, uh, in the original King Kong, 1933 King Kong, there were parts where King Kong was eating people and horribly brutalizing them. The one girl, he reaches in the window and he thinks he's grabbing Fay Ray. And as he pulls, he looks at her and realizes that's not her. And you know what he does? He drops her. And there's a shot of her falling from the camera and she's falling and falling and falling and falling and falling. And to like falling into a crowd of people from like 30 stories high. So King Kong is going around doing all this stuff. So when this movie got re-released in the 50s, they had a lot of censors that they didn't have in the 1930s. And so they started to cut up all the prints of this movie to air on television. And they cut up all the prints. Like there was no one in charge of making sure that there was – a perfectly preserved print as no one thought about that stuff back then. Um, I recently went through that. Well, I can identify with that because I had to go through that when I, re when I had to reconform the CKY movies and transfer those uh, to high definition. By the way, I got a big announcement I'm making about that very soon. I know I've been saying this for a while, but COVID fucked things up anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was no one. Bam sent 
the original copies out to people like MTV and stuff. MTV was like, yeah, we want to air a clip on Viva La Bam. Bam would like send them the movie and then they'd never send them back. Like, and I went looking for the movies one time. I'm like, where are they? He's like, I guess no one sent them back. I was like, Bam, do you realize that the best copy we have of these films is on fucking VHS? I cried. I know I, I cried when I realized that some of these films are gone. Luckily, we rebuilt them. Uh, so um, anyway, oh, what I was getting to. So luckily, they found a 16 millimeter print that someone had put tucked away in the film can and they forgot about. And it looked great. Like it was like pr almost perfectly preserved. And luckily, uh, what's his name? Peter Jackson did a lot of work in restoring uh, that film. Um, oh, it, it, fuck. if you want, oh, you got to get this version, the two disc special version of the original King Kong, because Peter Jackson, who made the King Kong movie that I'm not too crazy about, but it was, a, a, my mom loved it. Uh, he made like an eight part series of the, how they made the original King Kong and all the content together is like four hours of all, how they made the, the sounds, how they, they, they did all the effects. And he even recreated a scene of this movie that was thought to be lost, which was a snake pick scene. And not only did he recreate it. Okay. So there was one still in Forrest J. Ackerman's movie. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. I, I got to show you something. Hold on. I just happen to have a copy right here because the magazine rack is right there. But uh, so Forrest Ackerman had a um, publication called Best of Famous Monsters. And this was basically a, the, your first monster fan magazine in this, the 60s through the 1980s. And um, he and he, actually he did this right. He, he was here in Philadelphia and some he got hold of all these stills and he would have people make these articles Look, they would sell merchandise that they would make up in North Philadelphia. Um, I mean, this this was groundbreaking. The smell. I can't tell you the smell of these magazines. Because I used to read these when I was little. And I, I we couldn't afford them new because we were very poor. And, uh, God, that, that brings back the memories of my youth at the old comic book stores before comic book collecting was a thing. So, anyway, Forrest Ackerman, in one of these Best of Famous Monster movies, had a picture of a spider, a puppet spider. And he said that was from a lost scene, a uh, spider sequence scene from the original King Kong. And it's it was a controversy as no one even knows if this scene was shot. Um, all there was was a still and a little blurb. And some people, some people claim that they saw it in one of the uh, in the theater and you know, it was in a couple of the copies, but it was cut for time or something like that, but it, 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 it's never been confirmed. So in this special, in this two disc special edition, Peter Jackson recreates the spider pit sequence, but he does it using the original technology that they made in this film. No, no, no. He doesn't do some CGI bullshit with a, I, I hate most CGI. Some of it I really love, but I'll, we'll get into that in another thing. Anyway, he took the original movie cameras that they would use. They shot it on film, frame by frame. They did that. They they recreated the Kong puppet with use lo looking at the original armatures of the original King Kong that Willis O'Brien made. And they, they even used a rabbit fur coat, Dave Altman. They even used a rabbit fur coat for, for the fur. And, and so using 1930s technology, 1930s techniques and 1930s lights and everything, they recreated the spider pit scene. This is the best uh, behind the scenes uh, 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 coverage I've ever seen, and I have Peter Jackson to thank for that. Whew. I thought I was tired when I started this podcast, but I am revitalized. Now, truth is, I've been up since uh, 6 a.m. So, uh, okay, so here we go. Um, uh, 
I've got a couple more chats here. Someone says, I'm looking great. Sexton Hardcastle says, I'm looking great. I appreciate that. Um, where do you rank Michael Mann, JT asks? He thinks he's the best of all time. Honestly, I'm kind of embarrassed. Um, most of my movies are old movies. I don't really go to the movies or what. Here, I'll, I'll show you. This is my office here. See all those movies? And those are double stacked, by the way. Those are uh, two discs deep into the wall. And out of all those movies, I would say out of several thousand movies, I would say 30 of them are from the 90s on. <laughs> so a little embarrassed there. But I'm sure I've heard of his work. I'm just stupid. Um. Uh, Corey Stack says she loves that I'm randomly on YouTube. You know, I'm going to do a lot of these. Like I said earlier today, like I was doing a live streaming video game thing, filming me playing Double Dragon. Like I would love to do a lot more, but I love the chats. You know, I still drink beer with hot sauce, Chinese truck says. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't drink as much as I used to. You know, like I used to do that all the time when I would relax because we would, you know, at first I would do it just to have a couple beers and it just to chill out. But, uh, then it became a thing where it's like, that's what I would do. I would drink beers and chill out. And I was just like, I just got fat and felt gross. And it just felt so unhealthy, you know? So I like lost 20 pounds, stopped dr drinking all that beer. And I feel a lot better. Uh, get a lot of exercise. I do boxing and kickboxing. Uh, Troy is filming, says, man, uh, stop motion animation film. Awesome. I need to see this. I've done a little stop motion animation. I have some awards in it, as a matter of fact. International awards in stop motion animation. Me, Joe Franz. Um, uh, am I going to see King Kong Godzilla? I can't not. I mean, I, I, I have the first one somewhere here on, on a really uh, bad copy. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to see that one. Um, let's see, do a, do a collection video. Yeah, I'm going to be doing a lot more video reviews, I think. I kind of enjoying the way this is going. Double the fuck dragon pussy. Oh, boy, these are going fast. Uh, oh, man, so weird question. Uh, Sex in Castle says, uh, so weird question. What was to kiss a good man's... To kiss a good Bam's ass supposed to be. What happened? It's a little vague question. It was supposed to be a movie that made money. Um, but unfortunately, it got pirated the day it came out. And uh, we could not. It was it was at the time when, like, you could not control pirating. Like, there was no such thing as a fucking copyright strike. And there's the Pirate Bay and all that shit. And it was, like, literally overnight. Wh while we were making that movie, from the time we got it completed and the time we released it, within, like, that two-month period, it became something that a child could do was rip a DVD and put it on the internet. And there was a zillion of these sites and uh, Hollywood couldn't figure out what to do about it. I mean, you know, you had, you know, lawyers that are making, you know, $400,000 a year working for Paramount trying to figure out how to get, uh, you know, the, the new wall, uh, Mark Wahlberg movie off there. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, I re-edited Ming Hags for the HD version. I actually cut a lot of that movie. Um, so if you listen to the commentary of that film, Bam says it right on there. He was under the influence of, of a lot of cocaine. So this isn't me like some insider secret. Oh, France is talking shit. France is a shit talker. That's all France does is talk shit. Blah, blah, blah. I read the comments all the time about that. But Bam says he was on cocaine in the commentary of the movie Ming Hags. So I'm just saying the truth. And I don't say nothing but the truth. And you can take that to the bank. And France always comes with receipts. So um, the movie was all over the place. You know, and it was one of my big regrets was not uh, getting in there more in the editing room. But um, Bam was, he was very hard to deal with. Um, you could be around him for like for like a couple hours and everything would be great. And all of a sudden he'd fly off the handle. He'd be very angry, start screaming. Um, 
I had to steer clear clear than uh, there was a time when I got I actually got fired from the movie Make Hags. It's a, it's a long story. I got fired and then they realized like Bam fucking got mad at me over something that was in his head that he made up because he was up all night, one night drinking. And then he realized, wait a minute, France is the only one who knows how to make a movie here. Oh, I was the only guy who could work the camera and the only guy who worked on the production schedule. So I went to Phil and April's house and they were like, what are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be filming? And I was like, yeah, until your son fired me. And Phil was like, oh, what a mistake. So we all just kind of hung out and Bam called. Yo, what are you doing? I'm hanging out with your parents, Bam. Ooh. You want to let bygones be bygones? I was like, absolutely, dude. We have a commitment to this film. Let's fucking do it. The Dutons were there for that. They'll tell you. It's funny. Later on that night, I got uh, cornered by a raccoon. It was, I, was in Bam's ha I was in Bam's yard, and I saw this big old raccoon. And so I took off my leather jacket, and I kind of waved it at the raccoon. But I didn't know it. I'd never been around a raccoon before, but raccoons are not scared of people. They don't give a shit. It's funny. Boars are like that, too. You go to Europe, and like they're like, I don't understand why you Americans need guns. It's like, number one, we want guns because we're American, motherfucker. But number two, we get to have guns. Our government doesn't take them away. And number three, if you've ever been attacked or had your child attacked by a raccoon or a boar, you're going to wish that you had a rifle. I mean, dude, if you see a raccoon or a boar snooping around your kid's sandbox, you go get the you get that kid in the house, you go get the gun. Because that thing will keep coming back. And they are not afraid. They're not, it's not like a deer where you go, boo. And then they scamper off into the woods. So I'm looking at this raccoon and he looks up at me and I'm waving my leather jacket. God, get out of here. And he looks at me and he goes, <laughs> and I was like, where did that come from? So I'm backing up and I'm backing up. Now the goddamn thing has me cornered in between. Uh, there was like a stack of lumber and a trailer and like I'm cornered. So I took my leather jacket and I, I start whooping it on the ground going, yeah, get out of here. Yeah. Get the, you know, I'm cursing and screaming and carrying on. And find the thing just got bored and just walked away. The thing was like, Poof, you're lucky. I don't feel like eating you. So the dudesons and everyone comes running up and they were like, where's Bam? And I was like, I don't know. They thought I was beating Bam up, in other words. So there was that whole fight that happened earlier and the screaming match and all this shit, they thought that I was kicking Bam's ass. That was a long story. Uh, so, uh, all right, so let me get back here. I'm losing some chats here. Um, wow, there's a lot of Jesus, where did I? I'm falling behind here. Um, uh, someone, uh, Chinese truck says, you dropped a bomb on me, baby. I'd uh, yell, but I'm in Philadelphia, and my neighbors will call the cops. Um, uh, CKY5 is rumored to be in the works, but we'll have a different name. Probably a, a rework of I needed time to stay useless. Dude, I'm going to say it right now. If you think I needed time to stay useless is coming out anytime soon, <laughs> I'll t maybe I can talk about that another time. It's, it's a whole story with that film. But uh, yeah. Now, I am, well, fuck, I, I'm a couple days away from announcing it. So I'll just say it right now. Um, we do have a distribution company for the CKY films remastered. And so I, so these films that are remastered now, they were on danger cats TV. The problem was no one went to danger cats TV or they just cared, didn't care about it. It, it didn't, it was a valiant effort by those guys. Like I really do applaud them for trying to have their own platform, but I mean, most startup companies don't work out. It's not, anything bad on them. It's just one of those things that didn't work out because at the same time COVID came out and everyone just signed up for Netflix. Disney plus came out, you know, it's like six bucks a month. It's like, eh, I could put that towards my Netflix, you know, just really to watch the CKY films is their big attraction. Plus 
they the problem was they weren't broadcast in high definition like they were only broadcast it, 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 they were very compressed it was it you know they just they tried so anyway so no one's really seen the, the movies in high definition so when when so uh so the, it works like this uh we just partnered up with this uh, distribution company we signed all the paperwork today uh, multicom is the name of the company and so they're going to be repping the project uh, so that you got the six CKY films, CKY, CKY one through four, Haggard and Minghags. Oh yeah. And you also got, uh, Iceland waterfall. So they're going to be taking them around, um, to, uh, you know, all the Netflixes and Amazons and Boings and bingos or what the hell they're called. I don't know. You know, there's a million of these cool streaming services. I, I, I'm not hip enough to know about them. I just watched the movies I showed you. I have on my wall here. I got thousands of them anyway. So what I want to do is I, I want to offer limited edition autograph Blu-rays for people who want to own these movies because they're never going to look as good. Uh, not never, but now today's technology, they're not going to look as good as they're going to look on your, on your Blu-ray. And I know collectors want to own something and they want to own something that's autographed. So for like 20 bucks, I'm going to offer the one time, this is the only time it's ever going to happen for like 20 bucks. You can have your name in the credits under special thank you on all CKY one through four Haggard and Ming Hags. Like, just imagine that, you know, like if someone told me that for 20 bucks, I could have my name on clerks one and two and Jay and silent Bob strike back. And those movies for 20 bucks, I could have my name in the credits under special thank you, you know? So I figured, and what I'm going to do with that money is raise so, oh yeah, so so for the history of the movies, for as long as these movies exist, it will they will never be taken off. Your movies, will, <coughs> your name will live with these movies for twenty dollars. So I'm going to take that money, and it's not going to go in my greedy pocket. It's going to go towards Blu-rays, and hopefully, if there's enough money, um, and this goes back to CKY five, I have in this office right now, I have about six hundred hours of CKY footage. Only a couple hours of those have been used for anything. Now, I know what the trolls are going to say. You know, Franz sits there at his desk and he thinks like, dude, you're going to show us a bunch of shit that we didn't want to see to begin with just to line your fucking greedy pockets. You, Franz is such a fucking money grub and fucking asshole. You know how much, how little money I've made remastering these movies? I got an advance from, it. like, this is all shit that I do from the heart. Like I don't get, dude, I get, hey, hey, when I go to work for National Geographic or Discovery Channel, I make a lot of money. Like, like the reason I can write books and shit like that is because I can take nine months off a year. That's how good I do on these movies, on these TV shows. Now I could keep working on those shows and really line my pockets, but I don't, I take my time and I do my works of art. So with my advance, from I figured it out on paper one day, um, my my advance from Danger Cats to make to reconform the CKY movies, um, I man I made like six dollars an hour for five months. You try living on that, right? So it's like you know it kind of like it's it it. it, it I rarely get bummed out about comments and stuff when I see posts about like how I'm like pocketing all this money. Like this is something that like, I just wouldn't feel right if I didn't do it. You know, the CKY movies have always meant so much to me. It was a very special thing that I, that I was involved with. And I wouldn't feel right if I didn't preserve these movies for future generation. And like most of this shit, like all this shit, I live in this cool house and you know, I'm surrounded by cool things and, and like, I have, but when I don't care about dying, like when I, when I die, I'll be dead. Like, look at, look, I got all these original mad magazines from the 1960s and seventies. And like, you know, I, I, I got a lot of cool things in this life, but when I'm dead, I'll just be dead. Like, I don't care what people will think of me, but I want people to have these CKY films forever. And, um, so that's where my heart is at. So anyway, so when we do this, this uh the cky release coming up um you know and, and people get a chance to, for twenty dollars to get their names in the films 
you know, they deserve that credit because that will help me perpetuate these movies. So, like I said, I'm gonna make the Blu-rays, gonna all gonna get them signed and offer those. And then if there's any money there, I will release unseen CKY footage. Whether I make money or not, you know, and if I do make money, cool. I don't think I will. But um, anyway. Oh, I wanted to shout out a very dear, dear friend of mine. Uh, boy, and her name has changed several times. So I'm not sure what it is. It's Cat in Color or Color Cat. They're my friend on Twitter and Instagram and stuff like No, I don't think, I don't even think she's on Instagram. Anyway, this person, Color Cat, reached out to me when I was making these, these when I was reconforming the CKY films. And I get, uh, you know, I get a lot of people who, contact me on social media and they say like, Hey, you know, I'd really like to be involved with something you're working on, you know? And a lot of times it doesn't work out. Cause a lot of times I'm not looking for anybody or whatever, or it doesn't, they can't, they don't have a skill set that I actually need or maybe they want, uh, you know, but cat was a soldier and color cat sat with me for those five months and helped make these films. And it, it you know, looking at every shot, looking at raw footage, finding the raw footage shots out of hundreds of hours of footage and reconforming the films with me. And uh, so if you notice, uh, Color Cat in return was, uh, I, I rewarded her with um, uh, director of, uh, you know, a, a cool title, which is all that I had the resources to do. Um, but boy, to, anyway, shout out to Cat. I love you. You have a very special place in my heart. Anyway, I am really getting caught up on an emotional joy ride. Let's get through this. It's time to bring this thing to an end here. Let's see if there's any closing thoughts. Um, now that we've done our King Kong expose. Uh, put them on Amazon Prime. I. Everyone always tells me where to put out the... I don't... It is... You know how hard it is to, hey, here's someone's idea of how to distribute a film. Hey, man, put it on Netflix. Hey, man, put it on Amazon. Dude, Disney Plus, man, they got all kinds of movies on there. They don't kind of be Disney. They don't take your calls, dude. Like, you need to know somebody who knows somebody who, like, is, like, one of their brothers or lovers or something like I I'm just some dude who writes books and makes movies. Like I'm not some high top, high tier Hollywood big shot. Like I don't, you know, it's you, you can't just call and say, Hey, I got this movie. Yeah. Uh, do you, um, do you want to speak to our janitor? He's pushing a broom right now, but maybe he can uh, talk to you in between sweeps. It it's just, Anyway, so I appreciate the input. I know you want to see it on there. I want to see it on there too, but that's what Multicom is going to do for us. Uh, uh, the glorious game. I don't know what that is. Um, someone says the smoker for Jersey, from Jersey. I haven't seen the smoker from Jersey in a long time. But when the last time I saw her, she was doing great. Very, very happy for her. Um. Hey, uh, Fright Club says, uh, you'll do it for me. You've got some films on there. Hey, man, if you can get us a deal, please reach out to me. <laughs> so Wes, Wes says he knows a janitor at Disney. <laughs> uh, cool, I'll sleep with him. Uh, maybe we can get somewhere with this. Uh, do I still connect with Jess? Yeah, I just saw Jess uh, just the other day um, over, over Bam's house. I was filming some B-roll stuff for, uh, for the Novak movie, the Novak documentary. Um, doo -doo -doo. okay. Well, it looks like I think it's time to cut out because someone's asking, where is Deco? I think, I think I will do there. There are so many, there's so many, cons okay. Conspiracy theories. Let's talk about Deco and let's talk about conspiracy theories. Cause this is so very important for you to understand this. And it's just fascinating when you think about it. Right. Um, 9-11, for the first time, America has on 
you know, we see a building fall in free fall and something about it doesn't make sense. There's all these rumors going on that, you know, that no one filmed the first building happening, even though there's there's literally like eight different angles of the first building falling. People just happen to be filming in that area all the damn time. But Oh, no one filmed the first building fall. And George Bush said he saw it. Then it was, you know, pool building seven and, you know, all this. Sometimes there are things in life that don't look right to us. And that's okay because we are an inquisitive race of people. We are always looking for answers, which is very important a facet of the human condition. But um, one of the drawbacks of that is we create a narrative in our mind to seal the gaps where something doesn't make sense. It's like where something doesn't make sense, imagine it's like cracked cement. It's like, like you're looking at the sidewalk, big big sidewalk and it has these huge cracks in it. Like, well, this doesn't look right. So you mix your own cement and you put it in the cracks. Those, these are conspiracy theories. So as far as deco goes, there are so many conspiracy theories. And I've talked a little about just really what happened. And everyone's like, sounds like a lie. You can tell France is lying by his body language. Did you see the way his right eye twitched when he said the word deco the fourth time? He's lying. So, you know, I think one day I will tell the, the, the full story of Deco and why uh, we're not talking, um, why I would love to talk to him, but he's, he's, he's just moved on and he's over it. And, and God bless him. I love him. I hear that he's very, very happy. Um, so Deco, if you catch wind of this, I love you, dude. And you don't have to call me. We don't got to be friends. You know, we don't got to play video games or hang out anymore. I get it. But I want you to know I love you. <sighs> so that's it on a very emotional note. It was an emotional night. It was a hard night. And uh, so I'm going to end this stream now. Thanks again for watching. Uh, please tell your friends and keep your eye out for more stuff. And I love you. Bye-bye.